course I would come. I couldn't resist <laughs> being here today in front of you and, and talking about, well, my concerns for actually for the last 15 years, but I will be talking about what I've been doing the last two. Um, well, I will, I will start. Uh, well, no, just before anything, um, allow me to be very informal about that, okay? Um, there is a whole academic and scientific apparatus behind what I'm going to say, but really we can we, we'll talk about it if need be. But I think that what I want to do here is, you know, convey some message, some concepts, and then have the chance to really discuss about it. I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say, okay, and your opinions, and, and let's really discuss what fight even about it, okay? So, so uh, well, I will start with a, uh, a slide that I didn't have when I came here. And I, I put it this morning because um, I was having the conversation and there are two things that really struck me every time, still do, which is some, what I heard this morning actually, which is that someone said, we don't know if audiovisual realism, visual realism is necessary, or do you know of studies that have looked into? And what I would say is that, well, we should know okay, about that, we should have these answers, and the way to do it is, um, has to do with interdisciplinarity. <laughs> what do I mean by that? And it is that, uh, well, there have been a lot of studies, and we should really, really start looking into what has been done. I know it's hard, I know it's not a field of research, but we should be really looking into what has been done in computer science and um, human-computer interactions. So, having said that, let me now, yes, formally start and say what I said at the beginning, what I wanted to talk about is my concern for the last years, and it has to do with virtual reality applications for archaeological dissemination. And uh, well, what has always uh, concerned me, as I said, is that we keep on saying that um, mostly they are images from the past, but they keep being empty. Some of you have already heard about that, okay? But I want really to, to put this in, again, in this context of CAA, where I have never talked about that. So first thing is that we are supposed to be showing what the past was like, but the 3D reconstructions are empty. And the second thing is that there is systematically a lack of evaluation of what we are doing. And what I believe is behind that is a lack of explicit, at least, pedagogical goal or theoretical um, goal uh, related to, to learning or even to archaeological framework. While, when you really look at it and you go into a deeper analysis of uh, virtual models, you can see, indeed, that there are some you know, patterns and ways in which uh, 3D models are being used. Um, and you could link them to different big, okay, um, theoretical, archaeological uh, uh, frameworks or paradigms. But what is there is, in my opinion, an implicit belief that, uh, and for this, you and I, Matthias, should fight a bit about that, which is that there is this belief that the 3D models are objective, and that they are better for learning because they are immersive and they are interactive. But evaluations in other fields and evaluations, the field that have been conducted in our field, um, show that this might be otherwise. Let's put it in another way, which makes it even more concerning or more urgent matter really to discuss, and it is that we have Build. We now we have agreed on guidelines. Okay, we have two international charters to talk about, um, the, the, which are you know the, the London Charter for cultural heritage and then the Sevilla Principle, more specifically for virtual archaeology. But having stated this, we don't follow them. Okay, we have um, we continue creating. Um, <laughs> empty, hyper-realistic reconstructions of buildings which are against at least four principles of the civilian principles, and we can try to say what's the reason for that. And it is that we have you know, two trends from two different fields converging. On the one hand, we have computer visualization, which traditionally has aimed for visual accuracy and entertainment. And then on the other hand, we have archaeology, which mostly aims at describing still finds. So they merge together and they, they, they overlap in this dualistic concept of reality that opposes objective and subjective, mind and body, description and interpretation. But still, 
Okay, there is a variety of models. And what we, if we were to find big trends, we would say that we have on the one hand those that, draw, that aim at reproducing spaces, while others that aim more at cultural understanding. And I have put some examples here. Um, and I'd like to ask the audience, which one would you prefer? We can, I don't know, maybe I should describe what they are about. Do you all know these um, projects or models that we have here? For example, Rome Reborn. Um, AIMS is a big, um, very ambitious project um, that spans main, uh, across, well, it's the work of several universities. Um, and the main aim is to reconstruct Rome as it was uh, in the early imperial times, if I'm not too wrong. At the beginning, it was totally empty. Now you have, they, they call this a typical street scene, so they have uh, populated it with people. And what you see is what Rome was, and you can you know, navigate it around. Then you have another version of the reproduction of spaces, which is the Virtual Museum of the Tiber Valley. And uh, this has been done by CNRS. Uh, in Rome, and well, the thing is that because humans, you know, still look awful in in, in these models, <laughs> what they did was to have the virtual reconstruction, very realistic one, and then um, shoot people, you know, while recreating the scenes and introduce them in here, which gives an even more an increasing um, sense of realism. And then we have these two, which are more aimed at cultural understanding, and uh, they go for more non-photorealistic, let's say, solutions, and the aim at interaction and understanding of the culture by, for example, role-playing, which is the case of the Rook project, or, well, we know it well, Okapi Island, and this had more to do with um, how we archaeologists interpret and how we, you know, um, socially interact about and try our hypothesis about the, the site of Tsotaluyuk. So we ask again, Having said that, would you, you know, choose one for whatever reasons? Yeah, this I like, or this, this pops up. I don't know. Any? I'd say I want both. I would expect both. You would expect both? The high fidelity of reproduction of spaces, and from that, be able to get close. That's an ambitious guy that needs a lot of money, <laughs> a big team. But yes, yes. <coughs> Why not? Exactly. This is what would. Yeah, but this is what the, they have. Those who, you know, the big companies who do games. This is where you find the big money, or you know, Pixar and all the teams like that. But we archaeologists, we don't sell. So, unfortunately, it's still the very old. I, I remember hearing this at CAA '98 and 2000 that well, we have to choose. Either it is realism or it is interaction, but you cannot have both. And still, I resist to believe that. But um, yeah. so, uh, you had um, yesterday in this same room, we had uh, somebody who initially showed another kind of example of a Roman house. And what I'm trying to make then, I, I would say, it applies to this, is that so um, always these reconstructions allow you as the viewer to go anywhere within that piece of road. And I wonder then, which I'll, I'll repeat it now, whether or not it might be a more interesting experience for us as archaeologists to actually kind of restrict where people go. So say, for example, in Rome Reborn, you can only go to the place where a slave will be able to go. You're only able to experience it as a slave. Or if you go into somebody's house, you go into somebody's house as a visitor, and you get then that concept of private and public space rather than the owner of the house who might be looking at it from a different point of view. <laughs> I mean, I think that kind of interaction would be really interesting. For okay, so you see, I find very interesting what you're saying because implicitly you are thinking of a goal, you know. Well, also I think it's kind of interesting to test then social theory because, you know, the idea that if you actually see a house only from certain aspects, mm. but, uh, in a kind of phenomenological way, yeah. you would actually regard that as the same building or even as the same concept. You see, yeah, yeah. So there is a goal. Depends also just to connect. Uh, you will have to grant me more yeah, time yeah, because no, we're no, having yeah, a discussion yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I <know the> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have to all of it because, you know, people can get absolutely lost in, in a 3D model and you know, you don't have always the possibility of you know, keeping everybody yeah. in. Well, it's, it's very dependent upon the motivation, I believe, which one you choose. I know, I know, I was going with, well, it was a bit to, to, to test the audience about it. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay. So why don't you tell us what you think? <laughs> I'll keep on after, so sh shall they Could ask we wait, now? Could, wait, to, well, it's up to whatever you. you whatever you, you want, I don't know, because then, are we keeping track of time or yeah, shall yeah, we do it for, for later? <laughs> 
whatever okay. you, whatever the chairs say. No, go you for the go question. Ahead. Okay, so let's go and then I'll can I resume. So I'm curious, uh, who looks at these besides archaeologists? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you also, know, you also have proprioception and you know, self-awareness. You should be able to see your body because when I'm in the world, I see my hands and I feel the temperature and you know, I know that my body is in this room at this moment with you. And we also have more psychological elements of it, which have to do with engagement and involvement, at, um, involvement attention, empathy as well, when there is a storytelling and you, or a role playing where, where you feel you know, for these characters that you have there. Um, there is also sus suspension of disbelief, the capacity of saying, um, you know, I will believe it now. Uh, contrary to what, for example, you had in this lady, I guess, well, one of the, the participants who said, I don't relate to it at all. Probably this person would never have, you know, this feeling of presence. So, um, there has been an evolution in presence, okay, um, starting from the 80s, where the, the term telepresence was coined, and it had to do with, I am here and I am operating in a system that is somewhere else and in order to, for me to be able to perform my tasks accurately and successfully, I need to feel as if I were there. So this was the, the, the very origin of presence. And then through the 90s, um, the research mostly focused on the technological capacity in really trying to improve the system and dealing with the factors that had to do with visual realism, immersion, this feeling of non-mediation, for example, in some cases, that, oh, one of the first the early definitions of presence um, said that if you didn't feel the devices, um, you were present because in the world, we don't use any device. So we had to replicate this feeling. Um, but in the 2000s, um, Slater and Whitmer and Singer um, put the emphasis on the fact that it was not only a matter of technology. It is, a, it is a personal judgment. You say how much present you feel in an environment. So we really needed to take into account the, the feeling that people, that people had. And finally, around 2002, 2003, a new, let's say, wave or a new interpretation of what presence was uh, came along, and it had to do with um, not it not being objective and standard and universal, but the presence had to do with this cultural and social dimension, okay, and the capacity of really interacting and the world being relevant for you. So, talking about relevance. Why, say, I've been talking here about presence for five minutes, why would it be relevant for us, okay, archaeologists? Well, as I said at the beginning, um, there are, we really should look into what they are doing because they have already answered some of the questions that we are now asking ourselves. In which ways they are relevant? So, first, they have established a theoretical and methodological framework, or frameworks, more than one, for design and evaluation, which is something that is clearly lacking in our field. They have also investigated the suitability for learning, since we implicitly produce models that, with which we want people to learn, we should have clear pedagogical goals and know what are the pedagogical implications of our models, because they are not, I'm sorry, objective, in my opinion. So they have looked into construct constructivism as one of the, the you know, general frameworks that, that really um, stand behind models or in or virtual reality in general. Or another framework is embodied interaction that you know encompasses well it has many things like um, psychology and cognitive aspects and attention and so many others. And they have also, as I said before, investigated the underlying factors. So when we discuss, for example, we should have both or why would we choose interaction over realism or why would on the contrary we tend to aim for visual realism, and then we find out that um, when we ask um, people, the white audience, what do they think, if they are disturbed by the fact that, for example, I don't know, the colors are curved, they would say, no, I don't mind, I really felt as if I were there, so maybe we should not be obsessing that much and wasting so much CPU, you know, or graphic card in making it realistic, it could be, you know, just very simply designed, very simply drawn, and aim at, for example, social presence, at being able to interact socially with other users. And so I come to what I have been, I've been trying to implement what I said and import um, uh, cultural presence into archaeology and find a way to use it as, as, a, as a framework. And this is the goal of a project that is 
almost finishing now, that was called uh, LEAP, and that is uh, funded through, through a Marie Curie um, Research Fellowship. And this is the general aim, what I said before, to produce a, a framework um, that will uh, allow us to better design and to evaluate the 3D models that we are creating. And to do so, well, you don't see anything, but just for you to see the main phases of research. So first, um, try to, to look into what cultural presence is and what the goals are, or how can we really import and, and adapt it to the, the field of archaeology. Then on the second, in the second phase, which I am all now almost at the end, is to build a virtual reconstruction of, uh, of a site, more specifically of Tsotaloyuk, and this is when Sarah and James uh, came to Barcelona and had these very interesting discussions about what it is to feel uh, you are there at the site in the Neolithic times, um, and build different versions of, of this uh, model, so um, specify what we want people to learn, and then through different versions, empty, populated, uh, just, the, just the objects, uh, storytelling, see what people learn from that. And the, the implicit idea, the premise, is that um, the more present you feel, so the more things you have in this environment, the more present you feel, and the more present you feel, the more you learn. So this would be the, the hypothesis, the research question that, uh, that I am about to test in the evaluation phase that will start in two weeks, mostly. But it's not so straightforward because um, the main issues that we have is that uh, we have found through, for example, well, I have put here one of the uh, uh, very relevant um, paper in presence uh, that that showed that interaction and multisensory reality are not intrinsically positive. For example, when they were designing for good interaction, this uh, was hindering presence and the opposite. So, as I was saying in the beginning, maybe interaction, we say, oh, yes, it is going to be good, they are going to learn a lot, because we made it interactive and we made it immersive. Well, not always. So the question here is, uh, and I do have answers for that, but we, we can discuss about it if you want, is, well, what happens when we want to be transparent as the civilian charter principles say, or we want to maximize learning, um, will we uh, really be hindering presence? And then if we hinder presence, will they be learning? So we really need to see how with this, this relationship between presence and, and uh, learning. But in any case, my opinion is that uh, we should go, well, we have two possibilities. And it is most of what we have now are models that aim at reproduction, at simulate, not really simulation, at reproduction of the real world, okay? Because we think that it is objective and, and this is what we aim for. But virtual reality can do more than that because if we aim at just reproduction, we can just make a drawing. There's no need to waste, to, okay, to waste as, so many resources and so many, and as much time and all the, the money that this needs. We can, we can uh, just do a drawing and it will show how it was or what it uh, looked like. What virtual reality allows, really, is to have an enhanced simulation, is to show the world from different perspectives, to go into the big scale or the micro scale, to role play, uh, to talk to other people, to really have this a feeling of what it was like to be there at the time and to go for sure beyond just pure visualization. So what I would like to, to, to say as a conclusion is that um, the advantage of cultural presence, in my opinion, um, in, uh, for archaeology is that it makes the rational experiential. And um, as I said before, it allows us to, to, to make the most, to take the advantage of visualization and all the cognitive possibilities that this offers, role-playing and embodied interaction, so that we should see models, not just as pretty pictures of the past, as enhanced you know, drawings, but as playgrounds for research and for dissemination. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much.